Hello everyone, my name is Akira. I'm a pianist, piano teacher, and a translator who live in three different countries. On my channel, I'm posting videos of my performances and topics related to and not related to music. So if you haven't, please subscribe and hit the bell button so you won't miss my future videos. A few weeks ago, I made a video about Dozen a Day Book One, but there are so many things to cover in this book, so I had to separate it into two different parts. And this is the part two of it. If you haven't watched the part one, please watch that first. And if you haven't watched preparatory book video, please watch that first. Before we start, many thanks to my patrons who are supporting me on patreon.com. And if you're kind enough to support me for $3 or $10 per month so that I can make these videos more often, I'll leave the link in description. But without further ado, let's start. The first exercise we're gonna cover in this video is group three, number four, which goes like this. If you watched my previous Dozen A Day videos, you already know that the metronome I'm setting at is 80. This is repetition technique. Notice how you're supposed to rotate your fingers like 3, 2, 1, 3, 2, 1. And you're not supposed to use the same fingers like this. Although you can play repeated notes with same fingers like I did right now, that's not the point of this exercise. This exercise teaches you how to rotate your fingers so you can do that faster later. There are several advantages to rotating your fingers while playing repeated notes. First, you're distributing load to different fingers so you're not working one finger too hard. Another advantage is that the next finger can play without the first finger completely coming up, like this. This becomes especially important when you're doing group four number three, which is the same repetition technique, but in 16th notes. Whether you're playing fast or slow, make sure your hands and wrists are very relaxed. When you're rotating your fingers, it's natural for your hand to go left and right a little bit. If I put my hands naturally on piano like this to play fourth finger on C, my hand comes to this position. But if I try to play third finger, comes to this position. And second fingers right here, and first fingers right here. See how it moved from here to here. If your hands and wrists are relaxed, your hands should go wherever the finger commands to, like this. But if you're tense, your fingers have to fight your hands to play these notes, and that's not gonna go well. Also, be careful not to push down your hands like this, because your fingers have to be able to relax and come back up. If your hand position is too low, then it takes a little bit more effort for your fingers to come up. As a result, the previous finger doesn't come up quickly enough so that the next finger can't play the key. Group 3 number 5 introduces you to chromatic scale, but only from C to E. When you play chromatic scales, you use number one finger on white keys and number three fingers on black keys. And because you're gonna curve your fingers and you use your fingertip, it literally looks like you are walking on the keys like this. Make sure you're not flattening your third finger like this or using your thumb on the side like this. Then you're gonna end up playing like this. Well, 
I didn't expect myself to be able to make it to the end. But with this technique, I won't be able to play smoothly, faster, or in a longer succession. Speaking of chromatic scales, group 5 number 4 is also chromatic scale. But this time, you're gonna have to go from C to C, a full octave. The basic fingering rule is still the same. Number 1 on white keys and number 3 on black keys. But whenever you hit these spots where you don't have black keys in between two white keys, then you will have to use number 2 to stop moment it. For your right hand, it goes like this. Now you don't have the black key here, so you're gonna have to use number 2. So you can go back to 313131 pattern. And another part where you don't have the black key, so you're gonna use 2. But when you go down though, you're gonna have to use number 2 finger first, like this. And one, three, one, three. Now right here, if you use number one first, and number two, and number three, you're gonna end up in twisting your hand like this. So instead, what you have to do is, now when you hit the spot where you don't have a black key between the white keys, you're gonna have to use number two finger first. Now you're back to normal routine of one three one three. And this happens when you're going up with your left hand. Now here, if you use number one first and then supplement by using number two and back two, three on black key, now you end up in twisting your hand like this. So instead, you're gonna have to do this. Anticipate and use number two when you don't have the black key in between the white keys. And again, number two first. And when you go down, it's a little easier because you can use number one first. And number one first, and if it turns out you don't have a black key, you can use number two. Chromatic scale fingering can be a little tricky when you do it for the first time because you're gonna have to anticipate use of number two beforehand, depending on which hand and which direction you're going to. But this is very important because chromatic scales are everywhere in music, and when you see it in the music, you're gonna have to be able to do it instinctively. You don't usually have time to think about fingering. Group three, number eight is C major triad and inversions. And this is a great opportunity for you to talk about the chord inversion and how to analyze them. But because this is not a theory lesson, I'm gonna skip that part and go right into the playing part. Fingering is pretty important here. I don't think anybody has problem with the root position. But the question is, how are you gonna play the first inversion and the second inversion? Now when you play first inversion, E, G, C, I don't think anybody questions number five and number one. So the question is, what finger are you gonna use for the G? Is it number four, number three, number two, and the answer is number three, because if you look at our hand, number one and two opens the most. And these are the fingers people are used to adjusting the distance from each other most. In your daily life, you don't have to do this, or this, or this, or this. So when you play the first inversion, you're gonna open number one and number two and try to keep these four fingers on the consecutive keys as much as possible. I often use overmit analogy for my students. For your right hand, same thing. E and C is number one and five, and then keep these four fingers on consecutive keys. And if you have to open anywhere, you're gonna open number one and two. 
So the fingering is going to be 5, 3, 1, and 1, 2, 5 for the first inversion. For the second inversion, same logic. You're going to open number 1 and 2 and then keep the other four fingers on consecutive keys. And do that for your right hand too. Open the number 1 and 2 and keep the other fingers on the consecutive keys. Because chord inversions are everywhere, my students are required to memorize these fingerings. And that means they get only one chance to pass these exercises. If you use one wrong finger, sorry, but you gotta practice one other week again. And basically, curb these fingering in your brain. Next, we're gonna skip to group four, number five. This looks intimidating first, but if you look closely, this is just C major chord plus A, and this is just 5-7 chord. So once you practice for a while, you will know what you have to do. But the question is, can you play these without stopping at 80? The key here is to rotate each hand as soon as it's done playing like this. And so on. If you wait until the last moment like this, and then you're late. Group 4 number 8 is trills, but you're gonna have to use three different combinations of your fingers. First, 1 and 2, like this. And 2, 3, like this. Three, four. Usually quarter notes and eighth notes are okay, but when you get to sixteenth notes, the fingers with same finger number wants to come together like this. resulting in playing two different keys at the same time. To prevent this, staccato practice is very effective. It forces your fingers to be independent and teaches your hands what it feels to play C and C, D and D. Also, try playing each beat separately like this. Or in legato. This problem happens because your brain's not organizing these 16th notes in a neat order. So rather than playing these as a succession of 16th, 16th notes, think these as 4 16th notes, but you're playing 4 times in a row. And between each beat, try to reset your mind so that you won't get confused. Group 4 number 11 is 2 octave C major scale. You've already played right hand two octave scale in group two number 11. So the left hand is the only new thing here. When you play the second octave in left hand, you're gonna use all fingers like this and then switch to number four so you can carry on to the next octave. Last exercise I wanna talk about is group five number six, which goes like this.
This is what I call octave chords. There are normal chords, but you have to add one octave from the bass note. This is one chord with double C at the top, and this is four chord with double C at the top too. When you play these octave chords, just like inversions, fingering is very important. For right hand one chord, C, E, G, C, it'll be one, two, three, five, because again, one and five, I don't think anybody questions. But what would you use for E and G? And remember, you open one and two. Now you're gonna have to open some other part in this part of your hand. So which one feels more natural? Number four or number three? And for me, number four feels like such a big stretch because number four and five are really not supposed to open like this. So to me, one, three, five is the only choice because this is too awkward to play. For the left hand, one, four, two, one. Because again, one and two opens, and then these fingers goes onto the consecutive keys like this. Now here, number four and five opens, but compared to the right hand, you're not opening for a fourth. It's only for a third, you're just skipping one key. So this is totally doable. And this distributes the fingers more evenly. You have huge open spot here, and then another little open spot here, and then in the middle, you have all the fingers on consecutive keys. This becomes opposite when you play four chord. You're gonna open number one and two, and then three consecutive keys, and then have a little bit of a skip here. For your left hand, open number one and two, and then here you have a huge opening, but if you use three, it's doable for me. If I use four, that's gonna be too big of an opening, and it's very uncomfortable. So for me, and I'm assuming for most people, the only choice is five, three, two, one. I've only covered a certain number of exercises from each of these dozen a day books so far, but all of these exercises are pretty important. So if you're studying these books, I recommend doing all the exercises under supervision of a qualified teacher. But in these videos, I wanted to share learning points and tips that I think are especially important from these books. As always, if you have any questions, please leave them in a the comment. If you have a specific question about your technique, I'll be happy to help you with online sessions. If you're interested in setting up one-on-one -on -one session with me, I've set up an appointment booking system, so I'll leave the link in the description below. As always, if you learned something from this video, please hit the like button so YouTube will know I'm putting out good content and it'll start suggesting this video to other people as well. If you haven't done so, don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell button so you won't miss my future videos. Alright, that's it for today. I'll see you in the next video. Bye bye.